Greece's economy has collapsed. The entire country is unstable. Anatolia is being flooded by immigrants from all countries surrounding it. Syria is being invaded by all sides. And Egypt, Lebanon, and Iraq all suffer from internal rebellions and strife. Not to mention the international commodity that keeps most of the world going is under threat. Is that 2018? No, it's just a 1177 BC, the year civilization collapsed. Picture it, you're at the height of Egyptian civilization. In the last few generations, you had a few rulers. You had St. Moses III, and that nut job Akhenaten who tried to change the religion and culture of Egypt, and then had the entire nation construct a new capital that was promptly abandoned after his death. Tut lived, and then he died very quickly and young. Ramses II foolishly freed the Jews. But then the apocalypse happened, and now you do nothing but physical labor. So, let's hope that Ramses III will be better. Although, you have heard that the Hittites have stopped trading because of some war. That's the time this is in. It's the time of the Trojan War, the Exodus from the Bible, and the time that Hammurabi writes his code of law. Also, the Great Pyramids are built. It's the Late Bronze Age, but the world's about to change as they knew it. So we're going to break down the collapse of civilization into three sections. 1. Who were the people that collapsed? 2. What did the world look like when it collapsed? And 3. How did a perfect storm wipe out all organized civilization for 200 years? Let's look at our rap sheet of characters. We have India-Pakistan. By now, the Indus Valley had collapsed long ago, and nobody really took their place. The immigrants of the Caucasus region just did not share the technology or the ability to construct sites like the old Indus Valley did. They practically started from ground zero like most nomadic people did. Unless you are, of course, the Mongols. Unless, wait for it, you are the Mongols. Alright, alright. I know that it was an exclusive Crash Course thing, but we could use one of our own, so we'll think of one uh, later on in the show. Anyway, with the major civilization gone, local tribes were really the only form of government, and one of these ethnic tribes controlled the Afghanistan-Pakistan area. The reason this is important is because this isn't the Atomic Age, it's not the Industrial Revolution, or the Iron Age. No, this is the Bronze Age where Afghanistan actually had resources to trade. And that was tin that was used for making bronze. Bronze is not a naturally occurring resource. It is a man-made metal. Bronze is made when you mix 10% of tin and 90% of copper together, and it could be used for tools. And it was used from 3000 BC to 1100 BC. And so where did most of the world's tin come from? It came from southern Afghanistan. So these tribes would sell tin for finished goods like hippo, ivory, and bronze. The tin would travel to Mesopotamia, where it's been uncovered that many ancient trade cities existed. And we know that these trade cities uh, traded tin because trade was recorded in cuneiform. The Mari letters are one of the most interesting documents from this time period as it describes the vibrant trade routes between the Indus, Mesopotamia, and Mediterranean areas. Mesopotamia, which a majority was controlled by Babylon, was the center of the inland trade. The homeland of Sargon, the Babylons had trade routes from Egypt to Greece. That's all Babylon could really contribute, seeing that there was no real natural resources in the area, but they are set up in the perfect position to link nations together for trade. Something so important that it would uh, lead to the Europeans exploring the world instead of being isolated. Egypt would be the last stop for tin regarding mainland Asia Minor. Egypt along with Babylon, the Hittites, and Assyria were the major trade and military powers and they balanced each other out. But Egypt was the ruler of the seas as they owned the most powerful navy and most of the ports in the area. Cyprus would be the final destination, for this is where copper was mined. There was so much copper that the island and the people were named after it. Cyprus, while not strong, 
was a major seaport in the ancient world, and most maritime trade went through it. Now, the Assyrians were a military nuisance to major countries like Egypt and the Hittites. They were so small, but yet strong enough to constantly be putting external pressure when no empire needed it. And so then we have the Hittites. The Hittites were an Indo-European group that owned most of Anatolia, or modern-day Turkey, and they also owned some of northern Syria, and they would be the main military rival to Egypt. These formed the time period's most important trade routes and international powers. Every nation here relied on the trade of tin and copper to keep society afloat, and if this tightly bound community ever lost their bronze, an apocalypse would occur, and an apocalypse did occur. But there were multiple causes. It started with climate change. First, there was a drought. Nothing out of the normal. Yeah, a drought's bad, but I mean, it's something kind of normal for them to deal with. And with good irrigation, it was pretty manageable. Most of the nations did manage it, but then it got worse. The ocean temperatures began to cool. And as they continued to cool, the oceans got colder and colder, which means that less water evaporated. So when less water evaporates, less goes into the air and makes clouds. When there's no clouds, there's no rain. Geologists have uncovered from Turkey to Israel signs that all the wetlands dried up during this time period. The cooler and cooler, the drier and drier it got. And those river valleys that major civilizations depended on were threatened of drying. Eventually, a famine struck. From the letters found in ancient sites, we find nobles, kings, tradesmen, and peasants calling out for anyone to send them food as people continuously died in the streets. Nature kept up her quest of killing the Middle East by creating earthquake sequences. These earthquake sequences would travel on active fault lines, doing one earthquake after another, until all the stress on the fault line was relieved. So it's like Oklahoma on a Tuesday. If it wasn't hard enough to survive Mother Nature's eradication, you also had man trying to kill you. The Egyptians, Hittites, and Mesopotamians all have records summarizing a tale. That tale kind of goes like this. Everyone was starving, and those who were fed enough to be healthy relied on trading and finished goods from what was left to keep them fed. Then, on boats they came sacking of villages and raiding the coast. The Egyptians and the Hittites could not withstand them, and their coasts were pillaged and cities were burned. An invasion force of unknown people moved as far in as Babylon. Not only did they invade, but they did it twice. Luckily, they were defeated twice, but not after decimating all land in the Middle East, from Egypt, Anatolia, all the way to Kuwait. So... There are two things to focus on about this. Who and what were invading, and how did it bring an end to civilization in the area? Let us start off with who they were. According to Eric Klein, whose lecture I took inspiration for this topic for, it's hypothesized that they were Greeks, Philistines, and Italians. Now a quick read of historical records makes it appear that they were a mysterious force with no real purpose for their destruction. But looking further into it, that's not the case. Hieroglyphs show us pictures. Now, this picture here is a wagon. No, it's not a war wagon. This is a travel cart. The invaders brought more than just swords and spears. They brought a family. Now, this is not Star Trek The Next Generation, where you bring a condominium full of people to war with you. No. You only bring families when you're moving. These invaders were immigrants. Uh, the Italians. Always being an immigrant to somebody. Remember those previously mentioned famines and droughts? Well, it's believed that the entire Mediterranean suffered from this. It's like when the Irish moved to the U.S. during the Great Potato Famine. You know, if the Irish arrived with guns and tried to invade New York City. But, nonetheless, they were immigrants coming from a famine land with nothing to do. So, we know who they were, but how did they cause a downfall to all civilizations for a hundred plus years? When the invasions failed, the Egyptians and Hittites and others 
were able to push them out, but the damage done was extensive. What was left of the fields were scorched, and major economic centers were sacked. Minor ethnic tribes were just wiped completely off the map. The biggest blow was to the tin trade. Like I said, tin was like oil to us. If oil was globally shut off, the global economy would crash. But we could still pump oil. They couldn't. Unlike oil that is almost on every continent, tin is located in limited parts of the world. To them, only Afghanistan had a significant amount of tin. So, with no tin means no bronze, meaning no farming equipment, so starvation just went everywhere. All major population centers could not sustain themselves. The consequences would not have been so severe if the economy of the time wasn't so tightly bound together. In the 1170s, the world was the closest it had ever been trade-wise. If an existing nation did not know someone existed, then someone that they knew knew someone else existed. No country was more than two connections away from everybody. See, the economy got so globalized that when one key person fell, everyone began to fall. It's like a bridge. If you take the keystone out of a bridge, the whole bridge collapse. So I mean the ramifications of this was massive. The Mycenaeans and the Minoans and the Hittites were prospering societies and they were wiped out in 30 years. The Hittites went from conquering most of Anatolia and being the strongest military power to not existing in 30 years. Egypt was just a shell of its former self, barely able to keep anything together and they went completely isolationist as they tried not to die. I mean, people forgot how to read and write. The remaining Greeks were left just surviving on scraps up in the mountains. And most civilizations started from ground zero. See, a civilization might be able to survive one or two natural disasters, but four to five and onward, I don't think so. I mean, nobody could survive a famine, an invasion that goes deep into your land and raids, a loss of farmland cities, and numerous internal rebellions. Unless you are the Soviets. Yes, this is perfect. The reason I decided to make this topic is because of how tight our world is today. Just be aware, the world is very connected. Our trade is connected to everybody. This has been the International Historian, and new videos are coming out soon. Join the Discord link down below if you want to be the first to be informed on new videos and what's happening, because that's where I talk to all of you. So. Thank you for watching.